Hello, I'm Ron Peters from Centaur, and we're here in my studio, Mystic Frequencies, in San Antonio, Texas. What you just saw was our quick little intro to uh, Blade Runner, a movie I've never seen. And as ironic as it is, the music was done by Vangelis using the Yamaha CS80 synthesizer. What's interesting is that until today, I've never heard his music from Blade Runner either. So we spent about an hour practicing that little bit at the beginning and some time for setup to make that whole introduction. Today we'll be featuring a test drive of the Yamaha CS80 synthesizer. The Yamaha CS80. Released in 1977, it featured full eight voice polyphony and two independent synthesizer layers. Each of those independent layers featured a full set of controls. It also featured patch memory storage for up to four sounds of your own creation by using miniature potentiometers in a compartment on the left side of the keyboard. It was used by Vangelis, Michael Jackson on the Thriller album, Olivia Newton-John on the Physical album, Toto. It was used by bands you've never heard of, such as Landscape, which the only song you've probably ever heard by them was either Einstein A Go Go or Norman Bates. Paul McCartney used it on one of his famous Christmas songs, which was one of those love to hate it songs, or hate to love it. <laughs> The keyboard is full 61 key weighted action and it has full velocity and polyphonic aftertouch. The CS80 when it was released in 1977 cost a whopping $6,900. Today, CS80's in good working condition can sell from anywhere between $25,000 all the way up to $38,000. And if you have the lucky, rare chance to find a CS80 that's complete with its legs, its pedals, the lid, everything that came with it in mint condition, it would probably fetch even more. It has a chorus, tremolo, and the tremolo is interesting in that when used, when you play a note, it emulates the sound of a Leslie as it speeds up. So the tremolo starts at a slow rate and speeds up as you hold a note down. And the one difference from, say, a mini Moog is its filters. There's just no filter like it on any other synthesizer I've ever played. <laughs> On the back panel, you have your usual jacks for your audio connections. It has left and right for stereo sound, as well as a mono central single output. It also has connections for a foot switch, as well as a foot pedal. The difference being that the foot switch is literally a switch. The foot pedal is optical inside and works with a basically a light bulb, and that's used for the the tremolo and chorus and wah-wah effects, ex the expression section of the synthesizer. The CS80 that I have came from Centaur and is featured in a Synth Wizards episode by the same name, CS80. When Centaur had it, it didn't work. There was rumors that it had poured out smoke the last time it was turned on. And in the end, if you watch the Synth Wizards episode, they got it running, restored, and to the beautiful heyday it once was before. The CS80 line of synthesizers ranged from the 225 pound flagship CS80 and went down the line in various sizes and models from the CS80, the CS60, the CS50. This right here is the CS30L model, which is Yamaha's top of the line monosynth at the time. And they went all the way down to their smallest the Yamaha CS01. Now, this little synthesizer, also a monosynth, was actually part of a larger system known as the, the Yamaha Personal Studio System, which featured a drum machine, this keyboard, a couple of mixers, and a four-track cassette recorder. <laughs> Thank you. 
So here we are in front of the CS80. As you can see, it's mighty and mighty big. Just the way I like a synthesizer, I like them big. The front panel layout is very self-explanatory. It's great for live performance, it's great for recording. Up here, this section here comes alive by pressing both panel buttons, or one if you want, and, the, and each strip here is its own voice. This is a voice one, this is voice two. And as you can see it's labeled out right here as well and can be mixed between the two with this control right here. These controls are unlike anything you see on today's synthesizers, organs, and so on. These are truly exquisite to use. They are smooth, they feel great, the ranges are just right. There's nothing overly sensitive about them. You can get it just where you want it, easily. Starting on the left of the panel here, you have your pulse width modulation, your pulse width and the speed for all. You can go from 0 to 10 on your PWM, 50% to 90% on your pulse width. The oscillators can be activated by simply flipping a switch. You want a square tooth, turn it on. You want a sawtooth, turn it on. You want them both, you can do that too. Or you can turn them off and just have noise, or you can use noise with them in any combination you like. Moving along, you have the voltage controlled filter section, or VCF. In here you have your high pass filter, low to high of course. A nice feature here is the resonance for that, also low to high. Then you have low pass filter with similar controls for low to high and the resonance for it. A lot of people see this IL and they wonder, what is that? Well, that stands for initial level, which goes from 0 to minus 5. So you can balance out a little bit with the other one without having to use your mix level down here. Then your usual attack, decay, and release time here. Moving along, you have your voltage controlled filters audio level. This here is the sine wave. You can literally add this in if you need to fatten up the bottom end with a pure sine wave. Then again, your voltage controlled amplifier section, you have attack, decay, sustain, and release, and the traditional sliders for that, as well as the level. And then over here you get into the touch response. This is your initial levels when you strike a note on the keyboard, and then when you push down for the aftertouch, this is your levels for your brilliance and the volume level that it attains as you push harder and harder for the aftertouch. The second row is identical to the first row in every way. When you come down to this third row of controls here, of course you have your volume. These keyboard controls here control brilliance. You could kind of liken it to your cutoff or maybe even a tone control, but the beauty of this is the low controls your low end of the keyboard and your high controls the high end of the keyboard. And unlike most things where you turn them up to make them more brilliant or clearer or louder, on this you go the other way to make them brilliant or more loud, more level. Then of course you have these two controls to balance that out. So if your bass is too loud, the way you have it set, you can bring that down or, you know, or bring up your high end until you have the right balance across the keyboard. Moving along here is your touch response. And it also coincides with the sub-oscillator, which we'll get to momentarily. It's on the other end of the keyboard. And of course you can set up your touch response for your VCF, VCO, or both, any level in between, how fast or slow, and your initial pitch bend you know, if you're pushing hard to get a pitch bend and all that. You move along, here's your traditional resonance control. And brilliance here is effectively the same thing as a cutoff. And again, your mix between the first voice and the second voice. And here is your tone selector. Now, all of these buttons to this point here are presets. These are hardwired presets. When you press any of these buttons, you get those sounds hardwired. They don't change and these controls do not affect these. Only this row of live controls will can tailor these sounds. The, th the uh, six white buttons at the end 
are all memory and live use. The panel buttons we just showed you. The memory buttons are the fun ones in that this keyboard does store patch memory, but it's not a matter of holding it down and waiting for it to remember it. Inside of this panel right here are four sets of these exact same controls that the panel has. So if you make a sound here that you like on the panel sound, you can go to your memory one, which is this first row right here, and replicate your positions and tweak them until you have it the same, and you're done. There's nothing to save. They're saved by where you've set these. Over here is our foot control, which is traditional 16 foot, 8 foot, 4 foot, and 2 foot. But they've also added 5 and a third, as well as 2 and 2 thirds which musically can be very helpful. Over here is your sub-oscillator, which we talked about earlier on the right here. Uh, the touch response for your sub-oscillator, notice how it says after right here. No, that's after touch. So when you're using the after touch, the controls here on the left come into play where you set them. You can set the speed from very slow to like crazy beyond fast. And you can set that for the VCO, the oscillators, VCF, your filters, or your voltage controlled amplifier, or any combination in between. Further, you can set it for sine wave, your sawtooth, inverted sawtooth, square noise, or if you go to external, there's a jack on the back where you can input your own. Over here is your ring modulator section. In here, you have your modulation, speed, depth, decay, and attack. I read that backwards because it's really left to right. But your attack time, you would set, and then your depth of it, your decay time, and then the speed, and of course modulation self-explanatory. The nice thing about this keyboard is, a lot of people will detune one voice from another to give you that, that out of phase sound. The CS80 has its own control literally for detuning. And again, it's not super sensitive. You can get it just right, just by the touch of a finger. And at the end here, you have fine tuning of the overall pitch and your coarse tuning. And it has a detent right in the middle. And surprisingly, every CS80 I've ever played was right on pitch right on the detent. Pretty rare for uh, most analog synthesizers. Moving along, you have a performance ribbon, which is essentially a pitch bender, but a lot more expressive. It's long. You can get very subtle with it, or you can go all the way from the highest note, and as you go down, you go clear down to where your oscillators are now a click, like one click a minute or less. <laughs> which is too much, but you can do that. <laughs> Lastly, you have your expression section down here. Down here you can have chorus, tremolo, or both, and literally turn them on and off at the flip of a switch. You can adjust the speed and the depth of the chorus here. The tremolo is interesting in that when it's on, if you play and hold down a note, it has a Leslie effect. It'll start out slowly and speed up as if it was the motor in a Leslie speeding up. You have glissando and portamento. Most people are familiar with portamento, which is the slide between notes. Glissando is the same slide between notes, but instead of it being smooth, it's half-stepped. It's like playing a chromatic scale between the two notes you're playing. Then you have over here on the left, you have sustain, portamento, glissando. These are for the foot switch. If you hook a foot switch up and you flip these like this, then the portamento and glissando only works when you depress the foot switch, giving you full control without having to take your hands off the keyboard to push these switches. And then you have sustain up here, which is kind of an overall release time when you, you know, compared to the uh, filter and the VCA up here. So you have a live action control that you can manipulate during live action without changing your settings. 
Deportamento and Glissando also has the time, you know, the rate, how fast it goes up and down from a long time to so quick you can't hear it. And lastly, you have the foot pedal selector, which you can use for expression, which is basically volume when you push the pedal forward and backward. This is the optical pedal I mentioned earlier. Or you can put on expressive wah, which kind of emulates is in a way the uh, sound you would get out of a crybaby pedal for a guitar. It's a very interesting expression section, but it's very useful. So now that we've dug into all the fine details of its features and the people who have used it, what do you say we take the CS80 for a test drive and really see what it sounds like? So there you have it, the mighty CS80 synthesizer from 1977. In the hands of a true keyboard player, it can literally sing. One of the most expressive sounding synths and very capable. If you'd like to see more videos of this nature, don't forget to visit our Patreon page as well as our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe.